ready for production. Thank you. Welcome, everyone. Hello. Hi. There you go. Brilliant. So, thank you for coming to this talk. I do have to give you a heads up. I, I think after this talk, there's no break between mine and the next talk, and I've got to run over to the other room because Venkat's going to borrow my laptop. So, I will run out, but I'll be around later on uh, if you have any questions. Right, so welcome to this talk on Kotlin. I'm going to give you a little bit of a background, and then we'll dive in mostly. This will be a, a talk where we will do a lot of code. How many of you have heard of Kotlin? Are using it? <laughs> That's not bad. When I started talking around about Kotlin about four years ago, nobody had heard of it. So I've been doing a really good job. Anyway, so I'll give you background. This was started in 2010 by us at JetBrains. I work for JetBrains. And we needed a language at the time. If you're familiar a little bit, how many of you have heard of JetBrains? Okay, we make IntelliJ IDEA. <laughs> and 21 other products that nobody ever seems to know about. Uh, so, we, yeah, we needed a language because basically what we've done is we've got a half of the products are made on IntelliJ, or the IntelliJ platform, and the server-side products are Java, and then we've got the .NET side, okay? And the .NET side is C-sharp, F-sharp, uh, not F-sharp, VB.NET, and a tiny little bit of F-sharp, and then everything else is written in Java. And we were getting tired of Java because Java was very verbose, and we wanted something that had, you know, it was a modern language, meaning it had functional constructs, or meaning you could just say, I'm using a modern language. And so we decided to look at alternatives. At the time, there was a couple of them. Mainly, there was uh, Scala. And we had certain issues with Scala. Uh, the, the compiler was slow. Um, it's not very, it's not the most easy language to tool. Um, so to give you some perspective, if there's about 35 people on the IntelliJ IDEA team, there's around 11 people alone on the Scala plugin, right? In contrast to something like Kotlin, when there's, there's about, I think, three people on the Kotlin plugin, right? So it's not easy language to tool. Anyway, back and forth, blah, 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 we decided to come up with our own language. And we needed a language that was concise, expressive, toolable, interoperable, pragmatic. Now, we accomplished all of these goals because it would be really bad for me to say we didn't. So let's just pretend we did. But most of all, we accomplished the goal of be being pragmatic because really it is about finding issues that we had with our language, finding issues that other people had with Java and other languages and trying to uh, address them. It's developed under Apache 2 OSS on GitHub and it has been there since day one. What is it? It's a static language. I keep forgetting to tell people that. And it targets the J J JVM JavaScript, and we have been working on targeting native as well. So we started that project back in September, and we kind of already have hello world, so to speak. So, but we're aiming that sometime this year we can show some demos around that. Why do we target JavaScript? Because every other language under the sun does, so we thought we should as well. Current state, it was released on February 15th, 2016, six years in the making. It's great, it's beautiful. It was, we have 30 plus developers on it right now at JetBrains. Uh, there is no real uh, kind of a business model around Kotlin per se, so you know, we, we use it ourselves. We've got 100 plus committers and we've got close to 10 products, if not more, using Kotlin. Some entirely built on Kotlin, some sharing code with Java. So the new C-sharp ID that we've brought out is on the IntelliJ platform, but all of the code written on the IntelliJ platform on the front-end side is now entirely written in Kotlin, which is quite funny, right? We make a C-sharp ID in Java. There's also external companies that use it. I don't like to name drop unless it looks good. Here's a few name drops uh, that are using Kotlin. And of course, you can use it absolutely anywhere. A lot of people first, when they talk about Kotlin, they think it's a, it's a language that targets Android. No, it just so happens that since we're compatible with Android, you can. Since we're compatible with Java 6, you can. So we got a lot of adoption in the Android market, which is fantastic, but the backside of that is, uh, you know, this isn't an Android-specific language. We, did, we created this for ourselves. We don't make Android applications. We make desktop applications and server-side applications. Given that it's similar to Java, C-sharp, JavaScript, Groovy, 
all of these, every language out there, it gives us a quick ramp up time. So you don't really need to, you know, it's not a complete move away from what you're accustomed to. It's similar quite a bit to what you're already accustomed to. And also, one of our focuses was interoperability. So we want, we've got, you know, back when we started this, JetBrains has been around 17 years now. So we had 10 years of Java code base. And we couldn't just close shop and say, we're going to rewrite this in the next language. We wanted anything that we do to be compatible with the code base that we have and gradually convert code base, gradually add code base using a different language. So we had a very high focus on interoperability, and we still do. So essentially, that means that anything that is available on the JVM, you can use today. Right? There is no real issue. There's minor little quirks that we've already mostly resolved. How can you use it anywhere? So it's completely open. You can use a command line, even Vim. Vim users? Emacs? Really? <laughs> CopyCon? You don't remember CopyCon? Copy to console? Never mind. Maven, Gradle, Gradle, as you know, has now adopted Kotlin as a scripting language. So you can basically write your uh, Gradle scripts in Kotlin. Cobalt, which is a flavor of Gradle that is written in Kotlin, and if there is anyone that still uses it. IntelliJ IDEA, Android Studio, which is based on IntelliJ IDEA. Eclipse, we create a plugin for Eclipse, and hoping that one day the community will pick that up. And NetBeans as well. There's, we also have started a plugin for NetBeans. So really, it's, it's completely open. And in fact, the IntelliJ uh, Community Edition, which is open source, has full support for Kotlin. So there's no difference in functionality between the Community Edition and the full edition. OK, any questions? No? Brilliant. Let's go to some code. <laughs> you can ask questions. I'll just, I'll just ignore them. No, any, really, seriously, a any questions? No? Oh, cool. That's cool. Right, so let me show you how easy it is to get up and running. I say file, new project, Kotlin. I told you he's going to borrow my machine. <laughs> Temp, my machine. Hardy is me. It's mine, really. It is. OK, let's go. Right, so. Kotlin comes with a very small runtime. We try and keep it really, really small. And so that ships. And if you're using Gradle or whatever, you just include the, the Kotlin dependency. I'm just using the IntelliJ build system for demo purposes. So here I have my, um, my source code. And I say Kotlin. And I say main. And I say main. And that's a template that spits out the main. Everyone at the back sees that, right? Cool. So. And now I can say print line, hello. I do this everywhere I go based on the location. And I now can do CERN, because that's really exciting. OK? I'm going to put two exclamation marks. It's so exciting. Run. You have incremental compilation. So the first time it's slower, then it goes faster. And there you go. There is my output. OK, first thing you'll notice there is what? The font. Oh, I thought you were going to comment my fonts. Um, no, the first thing you'll notice is, yes, it's fun. That's what we call a function. But I'm not going to make any jokes about that. Um, there is no class. Notice that? So there, you can just, the great thing about Kotlin is that you can just open a file and put functions in it. So you have top level functions. It's not like, you know, in Java you need to have a static class and then have static methods. In Kotlin it's kind of like JavaScript. So instead of having all of these utility classes that you normally end up having, you know, helper, um, helper's utility class, the god class, the other god class, all of these things, you don't need that. You don't have that problem anymore. Now you can just have a file called helper, and then another file called god helper, and then another one called something else. You can distribute your functions into files. I was being very, very sarcastic there, but never mind. <laughs> so that's what you get. Now, I can create classes, of course. And let me go ahead and create a customer class. 
And what I'm going to do is I'm going to just bear with me for a second. I'm going to create a customer class that's called that's got an integer, and it's got a property called name. Okay. Now notice that I don't have any open colon, uh, open brackets, close brackets. That's that's as simple as I can do to create a class. And then I can do something like val customer equals customer. No new either. No new. So there is no use. There is no need for the new keyword. So I've got this customer class, and I can run this, and I'll just get rid of that, and I'll say print line customer. Okay. So what I've done here is essentially I've created a class that has two properties, and these properties are immutable. Val means immutable. Okay. So val means immutable. Var means mutable. That means that I can read and write to it. Now I've also created a constructor. So every time I create an instance of this class, I have to pass in the two values. And then I can just do something like print line customer ID. There is no get ID or set ID. In in Kotlin, we have properties. We don't really use the conventions of getters or setters. Okay. Notice when I print this, I have a customer over here, right? The pointer. Now let me come over here and do this. I'll add a little thing called data, a data modifier. And now let me print this. And now I have a nicely formatted customer where I have the actual properties. Okay. Now let's do something else. Let's go ahead and create a second customer. Customer two. Customer. Oh my God! Did I just do manual refactoring using IntelliJ? If only I knew how to use the tool. Customer two, no new, right? And now let's go ahead and say if customer one equals customer two, then print line. Same, right? If I run this, it's not going to print out the same. But if I change this to one, it's going to print out the same. Okay? So you see that it prints out the same at the very bottom there. Okay? Now, that's because of this data thing. So if I run this now, it's not going to print out the same because they're not the same. So when I add data class, it does a couple of things. Let me show you what that does in Java. So here we go, Java. Customer in Java class、um, private int id private string name and now let's create a setter、uh, no a getter I don't it's getter getter and now let's create a constructor and now let's create、um, Override some methods. Let's override hash code equals clone to string. Okay, so let's get rid of that and go to editor tabs and split vertically. Come over here. Open that. Get rid of that. <laughs> Expand just to be fair. I mean, if we're going to look count lines, let's do it properly, right? There you go. There you go. So that's the difference between Java and Kotlin. Okay, we try to make it a little bit less verbose, right? Now you'll say, big deal. Any good IDE, as just as we've seen, can generate this for me. Of course it can. But does it also maintain it for you? No, because when I add a new property, I've got to go and regenerate. And do I know that the code that I've generated is the standard, or is it something that I've tweaked, right? So this is essentially a typical Java bean, and that's the the, the the idea here is that things that we're using over and over again to make it much simpler and easier and faster to do using Kotlin. Okay, to get rid of the gritty details and the, the redundant work that you continuously have to do. Now I said that this is compatible. Okay, so let me come over to my main. And let's get rid of this guy over here, and let's remove some white spaces. And now let's create an instance of the customer Java. So I say val customer Java equals customer Java, and one Java, right? Now notice when I do customer Java, I get ID, I get name, I get clone. I don't get get ID or set ID. I'm using it in an idiomatic way from Kotlin. So I can say name. Right. If I go to my customer in Java, and 
let's go ahead and create another file, Java, another file. I love naming stuff. So let's go ahead and say customer, customer equals new customer. Now this is the Kotlin customer, okay? So customer, I get a get name, okay? So when I'm using Kotlin from Java, I use it. When I'm using Kotlin from Java, I talk Java. When I'm using Java from Kotlin, I talk Kotlin. I got that right. There you go. Okay. Oh, and if, does, does that look good? Because I'm not getting any vibes from you. No? Okay, so if that doesn't convince you, this does. I don't know if anybody noticed, but watch this. Did you see that? It went gray. Why? Because it says remove redundant semicolon. Yeah. So this is fantastic because now we can also have arguments on Hacker News about whether we should or shouldn't use semicolons in Kotlin. We don't leave that conversation only for JavaScript developers. In fact, semicolons are um, optional everywhere in Kotlin except one specific place. But I won't tell you where. That's for you to discover. <laughs> okay, so let's do some other things. Let's go ahead and create some functions, right? So I'll say fun my hello world or her print message, right? And we use kind of Pascal notation. So I say message string and then I do print line message. Okay, and I can have string interpolation, so I can say my message is, and there you go, right? Now, if I want to provide a default message, what I can do is come here, a default parameter. We have that in Kotlin, so I can say default parameter is nothing. So now I can call message with print line, sorry, message with nothing, or message with something, okay? I can have multiple parameters, so I can do multiple string. And of course, I can have named parameters. So here I can say that this is actually message, and this is multiple, okay? So you can actually alter the, you can alter the, parameter name. If you notice, actually in, in, in IntelliJ, we have kind of this feature. If you notice, it gives you the parameter names, right? But you can't actually click on them. It's a, it's a feature that the ID provides you. In Kotlin, you can actually name your parameters. Now, that's good when you have functions with many, many parameters, which you shouldn't, but sometimes you have legacy code and you have functions with many, many parameters. You can get a little bit more insight into what those things are. Let's talk classes. Where's my error? Okay, so don't minimize. So let's talk classes. Um, let's say, for example, I have a person. Now, I also have an employee which inherits from person, right? Issue. By default in Kotlin, classes are final. So you cannot inherit from a class unless you explicitly mark it as open, right? Now I can kind of inherit from that class. Invoke it with a constructor. Now what I'll do is I'll say that this has some vacation, right? Employee has vacation and um, days, string. Days is an int. Now we can say val uh, we'll make another function that's calculate uh, vacation days, and that takes uh, a person. And then I'll say if person is employee, then print line person vacation days. Notice what I've done there. It's auto casted, right? because the compiler has checked that this is already a person of type, this is already an employee, so I don't need to explicitly cast again. 
And again, you're like, okay, big deal. It's a cast, yes, but we don't need to continuously repeat ourselves. This is the idea here, right? To cut down all of that boilerplate code. How many of you are familiar with uh, the singleton pattern? I didn't say it's good. I said, how many are familiar with it? Singletons. Here's how you create a singleton in Kotlin. Object, singleton. There you go. Right? So in JavaScript, you know we have objects. Right? That's about the only good thing about JavaScript. There's objects, and then there, and there are no classes. So we go through all different types of inheritance, like prototypal inheritance or prototypal inheritance to create these hierarchies. In Java, we have classes, and then we have instances of those classes. In Kotlin, we have classes, and we also have objects. Okay? So I can now create an object, for example, some value equals 10, and that is a singleton. There's only a single instance of that object. Now, that's okay if you're going to create a singleton with read-only. You know, if you're writing to global objects, that might be an actual issue. Okay. But if you want to do it, it's over there for you. Okay? Any questions so far? Not a single one. Are you awake? Right. What else can I show you? Okay, let's go back to functions. Now, here I'm printing a message. Let's say I want to create a function that says equal, r, um, the, r the same, okay? And then I take a, a message, one here, and, oh, by the way, if functions are fun, add to, I take a parameter and I add 2 to it, so I could say that this returns a parameter, return x plus 2, right? If it's a single expression, you don't need all of this. You can just do return, you can just do x plus 2, okay? Type inference is a big deal in Kotlin, so we try and infer things as much as possible. So now I'm going to do a function and I can do, for example, message, message 2 is string and this one's going to be message one, okay? And we say message one, message one equals message two. Now, if I use this, it looks are they are the same, a and a, okay? This sucks. I want to take a string and see if it's equal to another string, and I can do this in a different way. I can extend classes. So if you're familiar with C-sharp, we have the concept of extension methods. In Kotlin, we also have extension properties and extension methods. So what I can do is I can take any class and extend it with new functionality. So I'm going to take the string class and say are the same. And value string. And then I can refer to the instance, because this is an extension of that class. I can say this, this refers to the instance of that class equals value. Okay, let's get rid of this. So now, instead of writing it like that, I can say hello are the same as hello. Okay? Now, anywhere I have a string, I now have that new function, which is are the same. Let's make that a little bit nicer. Is the same. But what I really want to do is something like this. Hello is the same as hello. Okay? So let's first rename this to is the same as. Okay? And it gives me an error. It says you can't do this. Now this is one of the good things about if you're doing this with IntelliJ because I don't even need to know Kotlin. I just keep pressing Alt Enter and it fixes it for me. So what it's actually done is add infix notation. So in Kotlin you can have, a, when, when a function has a single parameter and it's a member function or an extension function, you can call it an infix notation. Right? So that kind of looks like a beautiful BDD or testing assertion framework. And one of the things that we wanted to do with Kotlin was create DSLs. And we'll see how this is actually possible. How many of you are familiar with functional programming? You have to be, right? 
Nowadays, you can't not be familiar with functional programming. It just makes you look bad. I saw a tweet some time ago from a, someone from the JavaScript community that said that functional programming is this radical new paradigm that has just come out. <laughs> Apparently, 75 years ago, this radical just come out. But anyway. So I have higher order functions here as well. So a higher order function is a function that takes a function or returns a function, right? So I can say func, and now I can say that this function takes, for instance, an integer and another integer and returns an integer, okay? And now I can call this function with anything I want, two and three, for instance, right? So when I'm using this function, I say higher order, and now I can pass in the actual function, and you can pass this as a lambda expression. So I can do x, um, let's say x comma y equals x times y plus 5. Okay? So I've created a high order function that takes another function that takes two numbers, multiplies them, and adds 5 to them. Now in Kotlin, notice as I was writing this, it offered me something else in the completion. It said, you don't need to put brackets around it. So kind of like groovy. And it is kind of groovy. So x plus y equals 5. That's exactly the same thing. Okay? If the last parameter to a function is another function, then I don't need to include it in the brackets. And what you can also do is make this kind of like multi-line. Right? And now it kind of goes away from looking like a function and more kind of like a keyword. How many of you are familiar with C-sharp? Do you know the using statement in C-sharp? Using is kind of like try with resources. We don't have that in Kotlin. But you can create it. Using. Now using is going to take an object that's closable, and it's going to take an action that's whatever you want to do with that object. And then I can do try Finally, this would be object close, and here I would do invoke action, right? So now, when I have my closable object, closable, whatever that is, whatever that is, something that's closable, and I say using closable, there you go. So now I can make sure that anytime someone's used something that needs to be disposed of, does that. Now, of course, I've used an example here that's closable. You can create your own function. That's something that, for example, wraps loggers or wraps some security check or does some kind of ALP in that sense, right? It allows you to kind of extend things. And in fact, if you're familiar with C Sharp as well, C Sharp has these words which are called async await. And async await are a way for you to do asynchronous programming, right? In Kotlin, we have asynchronous programming support in 1.1 via implementation of coroutines. But we have implemented a generic coroutine machine, and then all of these actual flavors of asynchronous programming are nothing but functions as part of a library. So async await is available in Kotlin, but all it is is a function. It is not a keyword part of the language. So I can have higher order functions, much like Groovy, I can say, for example, simple single parameter, single param, and if my function takes a single parameter, for instance, an int, and returns an int, then when I call it, I don't even have to do x equals x plus 5, I can just refer to the parameter with it, with the word it, so I can just do it plus 5. So that's a convention that's similar to Groovy. We don't have pairs in Kotlin, but if I do, for instance, list of, and I can say, sorry, we don't have tuples in Kotlin. We started with tuples, but then we got rid of them. We have pairs, we have triples. Anything beyond that, you can use a data class because it provides you with more meaning than you know seven values one after another. So I can say pair Madrid Spain, right? This is creating a list of pairs. But I want to be a little bit more descriptive. So I can say Madrid, Spain, France to, sorry, Paris 
to France, um, UK to <laughs> London to Eaton. Oh no! Um, to <laughs> To England. I was going to type England, not EU. Okay, there you go. So you see that this is exactly the same as this. What is this? That's a combination of the infix and an extension function. If you actually click on two, it's part of the standard library. It's an extension on generic function that takes two parameters and creates a pair. And this is part of some of the things that we offer in the standard library, such as, for example, let's say get capitals. I can say, you know, list and then map and here I would get the first of the two pairs, right? And then you could do things like, you know, um, sorted by uh, it first, which would be the first parameter, right? Or, you know, um, filter uh, those that second equals inside EU, for instance. Oh, God, I keep doing that, don't I? Anyway, so those are all things that we, par we provide part of the standard library. So filter, again, is part of the standard library. So filter, flat map, you know, sorted, sorted by, first, first or null, all of these things are provided. Talking about null, if I do val, let's do the full implementation of something. A string... I normally do hello because it's using type inference. The full declaration would be string equals hello, right? Now, if I do string equals null, it's going to give me an error because null cannot be a value. By default, Kotlin does not allow nulls, right? So we got rid of that problem. And then we say, oh, but you can interrupt with Java. And then we brought that problem right back. But by default, you cannot create nulls. If you want to create something that's nullable, you have to add the question mark. Okay? And now I can say, for example, string um, to boolean, for instance. That doesn't make sense. But as soon as I do that, notice that I get a compiler error because it says that this can potentially be null. So I can wrap this in an if statement, obviously, or I can just use what we call the Elvis operator. So that basically means that if it's not null, call to, string, to boolean. If it is, then you can't call that. Sometimes if you want to shoot yourself in the foot, we also have that. You can put the double exclamation mark, and you can say, I don't care if it's null, just call it. <laughs> now, when we initially created Kotlin, we said, okay, if you're using Java, anything that comes from Java can potentially be null. And what happened was that the code bases started to look like a lot of code bases with a lot of question marks. We said, okay, now we're going to annotate your library and so that anything that is redundant, you don't need. And then everyone used their own annotation library. So essentially we said, look, it's up to you. When you're interoperating with Java, if you think that the Java value is, can be null, you add a question mark to it. If you don't think it's going to be null, then don't add that question mark. Okay? Now, let me show you something. A lot of the things that you've seen so far are things that are kind of um, typical. To, you've seen some of them in other languages. Um, we also have in, in 1.1, we also have uh, type aliases. So I can say, for example, customer equals string or customer name. That's not the same as a new type in Haskell. Basically what that is is that you can refer to a customer name as a string. So I can say, for instance, fun print name, and this now takes a customer name. Okay? But that is, that is essentially a string. At runtime, it's going to be a string. Okay? But let me show you something that is kind of unique to Kotlin in which we call lambdas with receivers. So, Kotlin lambdas with receivers. I'm going to create a class, and I'm going to call it a request. And that request has um, a, string, a method, for instance, and it has a content type. Okay? Now I'm going to create a function that is handle get, talking like a web 
web uh, Node.js or any uh, Express.js or any kind of web uh, framework. And that's going to take a path string. And then it's going to take something special. It's going to take a handler that is not a higher order function, but an extension function. So I say it is a request extension function. OK? Let's call that a get. So how would I use this? I would come and say get index, and then here I could pass my lambda. Up to that, you've seen. It's, it's basically a higher order function, right? I don't have to put the brackets. I can actually do something like that as well, right? Now notice something here. This second parameter is not just a higher order function. It is an extension function. What does that mean? It is a function that belongs to the class, to the type request. What does that mean? It means that that allows me access to members of that type. So essentially, I have access to method something. OK? No, I don't. What have I done wrong here? Hold on a second. Oh, because they're not properties. There you go. OK, because they're not writable. There you go. Right? And print line content type. Okay? And you're like, okay, big deal. <laughs> but that enables another scenario. That enables something like this. Let's open something. Actually, uh, recent. Recent. Uh, open recent. Uh, let's open this guy. So how many of you are familiar with Team City? Team City is our continuous integration tool. And you, it's got a UI where you can define your continuous integration and continuous deployment and continuous build. But we've created now a DSL for it, right? A DSL that allows you to define things. So what I'm saying is that that lambda with receiver, uh, along with extension functions, along with some of the conventions, such as being able to do multi-line, to be able to pass the last parameter of a function without including it in the braces, etc., allow us to create DSLs that are statically typed. Okay? So here, for instance, I've actually extended the default um, DSL for Team City by creating my own pipeline definition. This isn't even part of what we ship. This is something that I've actually just created down here. Ignore that because it's not finding the dependencies. But if you look at the, in, in, uh, the actual, so you can see that this is, imagine that this is all not red. Um, you can see VCS roots, steps, and then there's a Gradle step, and then there are tasks, etc. So it allows us to create strongly typed DSLs, just like the HTML builders, right? So if I come here, and I say Kotlin HTML builders. You can see that I, I got this damn thing. I use Signal for the desktop, and you can't kill it. Uh, type safe groovy builders. So you can see that this is actually HTML that's statically typed, right? Now, would you want to use HTML that's statically typed? Maybe not, but it's trying to prove a point that you can create any kind of DSL quite easily. Now, one last thing that we also have, let me just switch over here, is Streams that you see here, so in, in stream programming, and you're going to go to Venkats now, and you're going, to, you're going to see streams, and you're going to wonder, does Kotlin have streams? We do. We used to call them streams, and then Java came out with streams, and then it felt kind of incompatible, so we call them sequences. So everything that you've seen when I take a list and I do filter, map, sort, etc. on it, that is all eager loading. When I take any sequence, any, any list of any collection of items, and I say as sequence, it will convert it into lazy loading. So you also have support for that. There's other things like first class support for delegation. So here, for instance, I have 
you can delegate properties and you can delegate classes. So here, for instance, I have a class customer that has addresses and a list of address. And by means delegate this to something else. So I'm delegating the implementation of that property to a different function. And we have built-in functions with Kotlin. One of them is called lazy, which means lazy evaluation. So I can just say, delegate this to a lazy evaluation and use get addresses as the actual work that you want that lazy evaluation to do. And that would return a list of addresses. So this would be initialized the first time it's accessed. Okay. Now, if you're familiar with algebraic data types in Haskell or some other languages where one type, for example, a Boolean could be true or type false, we also have that, not entirely in that case, but we have something similar in Kotlin, which is sealed classes. So when I add the seal key sealed keyword to a class, it basically is closing the hierarchy. It's saying that you cannot inherit from that class beyond what you've already declared. And what you've declared is what appears inside that class or in the same file. Okay, so we've made it kind of, because people are complaining sometimes that it's more noisy, so you can actually put those inherited classes in the same file and then not have to prefix it with the class name. So here I have a class that can be a success or an error. Meaning that, for instance, when I do a get page, instead of throwing an exception, I can say, if some operation is successful, return a success with the properties that I want in the case of it being successful. If it's an error, return an error with the properties that I want in case it fails. And that's kind of nice because now I can return different types based on the result. And then when I access it, it tells me where success, do this, where when I call it, it says, you know, when, when it's successful, do this, when I... Um, when it's not successful, do something else. Okay. Now here it doesn't show you that you're missing a case. So in, for instance, if I were to do that, it would still work. Right? Because the when isn't checking to see that all of the cases are um, covered. But if you use when as an expression, then it would. So if I do val x equals when, then you see that it says when expression must be exhaustive, right? So as soon as I add that, then it should work. Okay, there's an else branch as well. Okay, so let me switch back to Keynote and show you some other things. Anyone doing Android development? Okay, so then let's skip this slide. I'll show it to you personally later. <laughs> So, no, this is basically an example of what the DSLs that I was showing you, that we've created a library called Anko that allows you to kind of define your, um, your, your layout views instead of using XML, using the DSL. This one is more, this one is n more interesting, and this is the same thing that we're using for um, Spring. So, given that Kotlin doesn't allow open you know, you have to declare classes by open. Kotlin, the compiler has plugin technology, so it's extensible, the plugin. So here what we've done is we've created a plugin that finds, in, in Android world, normally when you want to look for, uh, you know, access a, an element of the UI, you have to do a search text. You have to use find view, the name of the thing you want to access, and then cast it to the actual type of component. Using the co compiler plugin, what we do is we actually analyze your layout and give you a static type instance of that object you want to access. And we use the same thing for Spring Framework, in that you no longer have to declare your classes open if you want to just be used by AOP that Spring supports. Spring Boot, I mean, you, if you were at the session before, they... We're getting great support in Spring. The Spring Boot start.spring.io already supports Kotlin. They're doing Kotlin-specific things in Spring. We've got a good relationship with them. Cobalt is a flavor of Gradle that was written in DSL and Gradle, as I mentioned. 
In 1.1, which is already in betas, we've got coroutines, data class hierarchies, type aliases, deconstructing lambdas, Java 8, 9 support. So we'll always remain Java 6 compatible for the foreseeable future. However, if you say to us, I'm only targeting Java 8, then we will just use Java 8 constructs in the, in the bytecode, okay? Next steps, if you want to learn more, kotlinlang.org, try.kotlinlang.org is an online IDE. There's also a bunch of koans that you can do on there. It goes through the entire syntax. You can also download them offline from GitHub and play with them. There are already two books, Kotlin in Action, which is no longer in uh, EAP. I just don't update my image. And Kotlin for Android Developers is actually like two other books. I also have a course on O'Reilly, which is like seven hours that covers Kotlin in depth. If you're on Slack, we've got over 5,500 people now on Slack. Very active community, very engaging, very open, very helpful. Of course, I'm not going to say anything bad, am I? Um, sometimes too noisy. No. So to summarize, Kotlin, we really did it as to try and create a pragmatic language to tackle some of the problems we usually had. We purposely tried to do it so that it has an easy learning curve, so that it doesn't take you months and months to get up to speed. And hopefully you've seen today that basically looking at the code I've written, it's very easy to follow. Interoperability provides you with a low risk. You can continue, you know, you can just add segments of Kotlin code to your existing applications and not have to isolate it, for example, in the, in the tests. And, okay, this is very subjective, but one thing that I found with Kotlin is that I can show you different features and you're like, okay, great. But it's only when you start to combine those features together and you start to use it, that's where you see the, the whole package of it, so to speak. And it is here to stay because we did Kotlin as a tool for ourselves and our commitment in that is that all of our products now that are new are using Kotlin and existing products are starting to use Kotlin. And our bread and butter continues to be our IDEs and our tools. And that's where our revenue comes from. And we're continuing and will continue to invest in Kotlin. And just to summarize, uh, Research Kotlin last night and then spending the morning looking at mountains of boilerplate Java and Android Studio. I see why they did it. And yes, that pretty much sums up why we wrote Kotlin. Thank you. <laughs>